Hello. Perfect. You don't have to say all that shit. I don't care. You really don't want me to write this? I, no, you, you say it all. I don't care. Okay. It's, it's what I submitted. It is what you submitted. Yeah. All right. So Michael James is the founder of 5150 Research. In 2017, a crack OSINT unit was sent to a timeout by an, a SEC KC court for a crime they didn't commit. They could have. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security barricade to the Kansas City underground. Today, still wanted by at heaven sent, they survived as soldiers of 4chan. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and you can find them, maybe you can hire 5150 Research. With that being said, Michael James. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> thank you for bearing with all the technical issues, and uh, thank you for coming to the talk here. Uh, also, uh, let's give a big round of applause to Adrian. This is, what, 10 years for him doing InfoSec cons and recordings and stuff? I just found that out, so I thought I'd blow him up. Also, uh, ShowMeCon, thank you very much for hosting me, and thanks for putting all this stuff together. Like, I've never been out here. This is the first time I've been to this location, so this is awesome. So give them a slap in the back or a drink or, yeah. <laughs> Fuck me. Seriously, if I just... Okay, that's all you got to do. I just got to jump. All right, uh, thank you for coming to the talk. Anti-OSINT as fuck. Uh, how to become untouchable. <clears throat> Uh, who am I? Uh, Ginsburg5150 on Twitter. Uh, you can find me posting about OSIN or just shit posting or anything else there. Uh, I did start a little company called 5150 Research. Um, anybody from Kansas City out here? Hey, Kansas City. Anybody been to Set KC? There's one. Okay, Set KC is the uh, the local meetup group out in Kansas City. If you've not been, do go. It's the largest monthly meetup group. Uh, InfoSec meetup group in the world. Just kidding. But you can look that up. We're known from coast to coast like butter and toast. So yeah, check them out. They're, they're, they're a good group. And it is really a very community driven thing. So if you get out to Kansas City and you guys have nothing to do, check out SecKC. Uh, I also moderate two different OSINT channels. Um, OSINT.team is the URL for our rocket chat. Uh, and then the open OSINT dot slack dot com is another one we got tired of the the message restrictions with slack so we moved to rocket chat there's people that will stay there and people that won't so but you find good information about osint if you guys are interested in that that being said how many people are, are familiar with what i say when i say the word osint everybody kind of somewhat familiar open source intelligence is uh, osint um just like anything else in the world uh it divides into very Similar different things, whatever. Um, you have SIGIN, which is signal intelligence. Uh, you have SOCMINT, which is social media intelligence. You have DARKINT, for some reason, uh, which is uh, deep, uh, deep web or, or dark web intelligence there. So there's different things that you can use as an OSINT researcher to go through and gain data and intelligence and kind of pivot off of to go through and do whatever you're trying to do, whether that's protect or whether attack. And we always attack to defend in the information security world. So, you know, that's that's what we do. I've got a microphone and cards here. Uh, let's see. So, how is OSINT used? Damn it, okay. Uh, how is OSINT used? Good, I'm not gonna be able to, I told you guys not to breathe. Um, OSINT is, is the, the collection of data to go through and to, to, to derive at a purpose, whether that's social engineering and you're trying to go through and fingerprint, uh, whether that's uh, to gather intelligence to go through and disprove something, fake news, things like that. Um, OSINT can be used for literally anything here. Uh, being in the OSINT community, we have the, the, the privilege to go through and see what actually is able to be gained through either physical intelligence, public record, digital intelligence, anything else like that. So we are a little bit more cognizant of privacy. Uh, so a lot of us are kind of privacy bound in regards to a lot of things. Um, that's kind of where this talk started forming in my head is what we could do to, to make sure that not only security operation or sec, OPSEC <clears throat> is, is, is given, but also what could we throw at people to go you know, give negative results in regards to OSINT investigations. So anti-OSINT. So anti-OSINT is not operational security. It's not OPSEC. 
Anti-OSINT is the active campaign of using disinformation to go through and actually create you know, false information for people to target you, whether that be personal, business, NGOs, government, whatever it is. The more that you see disinformation out there, the more that you have the likelihood of confusion in regards to an attack. Or so I'm trying anyway. Um, we in the attack sect, you know, in, in physical security and pen testing and red teaming, things like that, <clears throat> we are familiar with things called like sock puppet accounts. Um, they're basically, you know, avatars online to go through and gain information either through forums or social media, LinkedIn, things like that, however. But it's not known kind of all around what a sock puppet account is or how to go through and successfully set one up. So this is kind of a deep dive in regards to that. So it's OPSEC on steroids for that part. And then we'll get into a little bit more of the disinformation campaign stuff. What you have to do is you have to compartmentalize what your actually trying to defend or privatize though. So if this is your personal relationship, then you need to make sure that this is something that you're okay with for your personal self. If this is something you're trying to protect for your business, it needs to make sure that you are, you know, still abiding by all the laws and regulations that you have to, but still closing off enough of the information so that you lessen your attack surface. If somebody like a social engineer or a nation state or just Joe down the street trying to get free pizza from you is, is trying to attack that way. The, the best thing that you can do is start to make the plan. Um, you have to go through and stick to the self-assessment. Stop it. I'm really sorry about this, guys. There you go. That's okay. I just keep jumping. Uh, so making, making the plan for uh, the, the privacy mindset is really where you have to go through and start. And the self-assessment is you know not as scary as it sounds, but it is a necessary part of what you have to do or if you go through new specific search engines, um, OSINTframework.com is another one, is another one that, uh, that is very user-friendly, uh, and there's a slide at the end you got to take pictures of and stuff like that. Um, but just going through the bullet points of that, just doing your own reconnaissance in regards to your either personal life or your business life, your, your NGO, whatever it is. But again, you have, to, you have to understand what your own threat model is. So... If you're a 19-year-old and you're coming up in the world and you think, ah, fuck it, I really don't care what my threat model is because I'm 19. That may work for now, but when you're 75 or when you're 55 or 45 and you have more actual um, you know, wealth or established credibility or anything else like that, something from 25 years ago can really hurt you if someone discovers that on the Wayback Machine or archives.org or whatever it is. So you need to make sure you know what is out there. Uh, once you've actually made the plan, you need to make sure that it corrects for X, whatever that is. So if you have a plan in place and you're saying, okay, this goes way too far in my personal life, but this plan would work for my business interests, make sure you correct for that. Uh, sticking to the plan, it's really difficult to, to, to practice something over and over again and it's really difficult, I should say, to not practice something and, and expect it to stick. You have to go through and flex that muscle, sticking to the plan, refactoring, making sure as you make different moves inside your organization, inside your life, inside whatever it is, that you kind of tilt and readjust. You pivot from where you are because marriage is a big deal because that's public record. Divorce is a big deal. That's public record. Moving to a new company, that means that your old resumes are out there. And please, God, don't put your social security number on your resumes. It's funny, but it's not. Um, so you do have to continue to kind of flex that muscle there. I'm going to stand way back. Did it work? Nope. Okay. Oh, oh shit. We went too far. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's not supposed to do that. Okay, maybe it will. I apologize. Um, okay, so why do we need to start building accounts? Um, what does your privacy actually work to you? I know I was just on the slide, but I'm still just kind of recapping. Um, you know, we in the information security world understand that data breaches happen all the time. People that we educate don't understand that that happens. Uh, there are data breaches that don't get reported, and we are not aware of that. Um, the way that we 
kind of hedge that bet is if we have the ability to either put out the information that we want or the information that we don't care about. So if there is a data breach or there's something else out there, it's okay that it got breached because it doesn't come back to touch us in the meat space, in the physical world. Um, Chris um, Nickerson used to say, you know, you can go through and you can rain shells and you can pop, you know, desktops all day long, but if you can't get anything actionable, if you can't get credit card information or PII information or something else like that, you just wasted your time. And that's, that's kind of what we're defending here is we're defending, you know, the things we can't remove. Um, you know, if you have a social security number, obviously it's probably out there because of Equifax, but you know, it shouldn't be so easy to, to get that as, you know, three different URLs on Google or something, but it is. So we need to defend against that. We need to know that that's out there so that we can continue to kind of prevent those things from working. So setting up your environment. So you've made your plan. You understand that you know your personal section is comprised of you, your family, and then take it three steps out. You know, from you and your immediate family, go to their immediate family. Go from there to their family. The reason being is because the compromise isn't always going to come from just you or your family or your kid on Facebook. It may be somebody who you're connected with from high school. It may be somebody who you're connected with from you know a child's school or something else like that. But if you know that that's out there, you can at least limit what either you're putting out there or the information that that stuff is getting to them. So you can set up your environment, you have your plan, you've done your three stages kind of, of, of searching out. Now you wanna go through and set up your environment and you really wanna practice your anonymity. You wanna go through and take that privacy aspect to the next level. I have no clue when we started. How, how far are we on this? Okay, nobody does. We're here all day. Um, Chris Hadnagy, anybody familiar with him? The socialengineering.org? Maybe? Somebody? No? Okay. Anyway, he, he has a saying in regards to social engineering, and it's what we do before matters, meaning setting up the pretext or you know reconnaissance, OSINT, whatever you do prior to the actual attack is where you get the leverage. The attack is not what's going to make it successful. It's what you do before, and it's the same principle in privacy. You need to go through and think about what you're, pri what you're trying to set up prior to actually getting it set up. Um, setting up devices is, you know, a location-based thing. Anytime you connect to Wi-Fi, there's a, there's a pretty good chance there's a geotag set up on that IP range that if a, a forensics person or myself or somebody is going to go through and try to geolocate you, it will be able to pop up. So if you have a brand new device and you're setting up at a Wi-Fi, Starbucks, something else like that or whatever, and you're using it as a single point device, then it's good to get it outside of your range. Also, it'll be helpful later on when we go through and set up social media accounts. But for now, just like I said, anything you have new or any throwaway, you know, iPod Touch or tablets, anything you want to do that will allow you to, to, to become anonymous online, setting it up somewhere else other than your house is, is a benefit to you in the long run. And like I said, this is kind of a chess game. So you're setting it up beforehand, thinking about what you're planning on doing. If you're using single devices like a tablet or a smartphone or a burner phone or something, and you're, you're designating this as, this is the only thing I'm going to shop with. This is the only thing I'm going to check email with. This is the only thing I'm going to register, and this is going to be my true identity online or whatever. I don't want this compromised, so this doesn't leave the house. Now, that may be too severe for some people, and that's okay, because this is something you have the ability to control. But... The less that you put out there, the less, the less attack surface you have. So it's, it's something you have to be comfortable with, but it's also something you need to be thinking about, kind of educating or flexing that muscle, preparing that, that privacy mindset. So again, when you're getting into the digital um, kind of anonymity, uh, VPNs, uh, a lot of people will go through and put them on their phones. A lot of people put them on their workstations. Not a lot of people put them on their routers. Make sure that you are doing your due diligence and having redundancy. If one fails, the other one's still there. It may not save you, but at that point, you have done everything you can to protect yourself. And it's a little bit more technical, but if you can Google it or if you can read a, a blog post about it, it's not that bad. Um, there are certain ones that work better than others. Uh, Google has another one, or a, a VPN called Outliner, I think it is right now. Nord is pretty good. Just remember that anything that you set up with a VPN that you are not paying for, you are the product. 
So anything that comes through there, they're going to sell your, your data, your services, your location, all that stuff there. <clears throat> uh, Tor, we all know that Tor is excellent for anonymity. It has come under some fire in regards to being breached by the FBI and some other things. Um, that's, that's something that we can help with. Uh, Tor is also another tool that we can use to go through and enforce where we are uh, in geolocation, geotagging, things like that. And I'll get to that here in another slide, another kind of hot tip. Um, <laughs> virtual machines. Uh, I do know a couple people that actually only sign into certain instances of like Slack or Twitter or other things. They have everything siloed so much in virtual machines that they will only interact in regards to that one virtual machine. Once that machine's down, however, they will not interact in any other way. So they have to spin up a virtual machine just to get access back to that account, that social media, whatever, and they're completely siloed. So that's that's an extreme case, but virtual machines uh, have come a long way since you know, five years ago, even two years ago. It's much more user friendly to go through and use a virtual machine. So it's something to at least look into. And there are some pretty decent ones. Most of them are free, but they all install locally. So you have control over them there. Um, if you want to dig real deep into uh, to the the anonymity type of platforms, um, there's a couple different things you can do. Tails is amazing. Um, it is usually a, a load from either USB or CD drive stuff, whatever. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it only uses the drivers you have on the device, but it has complete anonymity, has Tor built in, uh, Tor Messenger, Tor Browser, all that. It's very nice. Um, the other way to go with it is uh, Raspberry Pis. Um, Raspberry Pi 0W has Wi-Fi, has Bluetooth, 10 bucks. I've got them for a dollar before at like Micro Center and stuff like that. A dollar computer is something you don't have to worry about throwing away because you can just do it. Um, and so it's kind of nice to have that range there. You know, they run Linux. You can get Wine. There's some other things you can go through and do if you're not native with, with Linux. I don't know in regards to uh, oh, iOS or not iOS, um, Mac OS with that stuff because I'm not an Apple person. Um, you can hate me. I don't care. Uh, there is one app that almost made me totally change for to iOS, Mac, and, and I'll get to that here in a little bit too. See, I keep dropping these things. You guys interested. Um, but Raspberry Pis, uh, I've been working with a little bit, and it's kind of fun to go through and set up, um, you know, instances of computers wherever that you can literally take anywhere you want to go through. Uh, you have it. You, I mean, it's just like a laptop or something like that if you make it right. But it's it's thirty bucks maybe for a Raspberry Pi Zero W with display and all that. Not bad. Uh, Mac addresses are something that we can go through and use to track locations of certain things. So it's your physical address online. Um, if you travel and you're taking your laptop everywhere and we have the ability to track your Mac address, we can pinpoint where you are a lot better than just the, like the IP geo range. Um, so there is something with Windows 10. Now you can go through and you can spoof your Mac address. Like it, Windows 10 will allow you to go through and do this. So it is, it is trying to help you with anonymity and things like that. But you also can use other programs to go through and spoof Mac. So it's something that you, you should at least be aware of. Like I said, the knowledge of everything here is what's going to assist you further down the line than actually trying to break the stuff there. Uh, and then again, like I said, the last thing is IP ranges, physical location, and geolocation stuff. Don't geotag your photos. Please don't. Or if you do, spoof the geotag. You know, make sure that you're in Russia. Just send it off that way. Um, the, the reason being is because there are things that, uh, especially like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, other things, and Instagram is really, really bad about uh, geolocation. Um, Instagram's a lot of fun, but they love to tag exactly where you are because the, the metadata allows them to go through and sell that to uh, advertisers, and then they can promote products closer to you. So the geotagging is something where you really have to worry about what you're sending out and where it says you're sending it out from. So just be cognizant of the IP ranges, your physical location, and then geolocation stuff. And like I said, the OSINTframework.com, Justin Nordine put this together a year, two years ago, and it's a mind map of all the different things that you know, basic OSINT researchers are kind of going through and checking. There's a geotag location uh, section in there, and just run your IP range through that and just see what it gets. You'll see some discrepancies, but there will be a couple that will be dead on, and you'll you'll be you'll be kind of scared. Um, so let's start building accounts. Uh, what are you looking to do 
What is it that you're trying to go through and accomplish online? If this is a personal thing, if this is a business thing, if you're an NGO that works with human trafficking or sex slave, you know, trying to get them out of the game and stuff like that, then you need to be really, really cognizant of what you're setting up and where you're setting the stuff up. If this is just something you're doing for your family to be a little more secure, you can be more lax and you can do Gmail and things like that. Just remember everything you're setting up, anything that's free, you are the product. So end-to-end -end encryption is good. Um, you know, Yahoo is a big flaming no-no. Uh, it was the number one breach thing. I think it was over 300 billion thing, uh, users were, were, were actually captured from, from the breaches and stuff. So if you have all that stuff, just, you know, please burn it down. Um, but what we're looking for initially is is the gateway accounts. We want the the email, you want the Twitter, and you want a Facebook account. And the reason being is because they are logins for several other locations. So once you have that key, you can say, okay, well this is my this is my sock puppet account for my Facebook, and I want to go through and I want to go to the super sketch website to get whatever I want to go through and do. But I don't want them to know who I am because it's super sketch. Your Facebook allows you to go through and to enter the website. Let them steal all the credentials from all that stuff, whatever, and not really care that that's, that, that website or that, that Facebook account is there because it's not you. It's not going to come back on you. Um, some of the things that have helped in the past just to kind of speed up the process is fake name generator or fake name, um, fake name generator or fake person generator, the two at the bottom there. Uh, they go through and give, Awesome. Awesome information. They will actually set up, if you want it, there's a paid service. You can actually go through and they will give you email addresses and they are live good email addresses that they have generated and you can pay for services to go through and activate. So if for some reason you are trying to get away from a, an abusive relationship and you set this up and you have the email address there, you can give that to somebody or you can give that to, to a company or something like that and it's live. It will, it will refer, it'll bounce to a real good a real good, it will bounce to a good email address that you've previously set up. There are other things like that, like uh, I think it's uh, GDX and G33 mail um, that are redirects and you can give those out. Um, I don't recommend a lot of those because they're they're kind of one-off things and it's it's easy to lose them because you use them so infrequently. You wanna, you wanna use something that you're gonna remember the password for or you have a password manager set up for and at that point you can continue to go through and use and like i said flex the muscle uh please don't go to fiverr and buy accounts i put this up here as a disclaimer because anyone who writes with ms paint on there it says facebook you don't want to purchase stuff from them i just if that wasn't known um but no seriously there there are so many different sites that will say i will give you 20 verified gmail accounts Sure, maybe that saves you 10 minutes of work, but you don't know who those people are. Even if they are the most altruistic people ever, they've set it up and they have a backdoor somewhere to that, either with a phone verification or an original email, and they can go through and get that stuff. So you think you're saving time, but it's it's going to come back to bite you. Just do the manual work and get this stuff taken care of if that's something you're interested in. Um, phones have become very ubiquitous in regards to everything that we do nowadays. So you can pay for things with your phone. You two-factor authentication with your phone. You write love notes with your phone. Everything you do is with your phone. Um, there's a proof of concept that I've been kind of working on for a passive way to go through and collect uh, cell phone information from people. And it's, I don't, it, do you guys have high V out here, the grocery store? So even if you didn't, which, which is where my original attack kind of, kind of was, but even if you didn't, when, when I got here to the conference last night, the, uh, the young lady who was setting up the room and all that stuff asked me for a phone number. And of course I couldn't just write it down. So I had to go through and tell her it wasn't a good phone number, but I gave her a phone number. So my, my, my proof of concept for passively collecting cell phone information is to go to those target locations that you know do either, um, uh, what are the rewards cards or, you know, they're actively going to ask you for your phone number. Like AutoZone does this all the time. You got a rewards card with your phone number. All this, even downstairs, if you take a $30 auto recorder that has 256 gigs, it's over like a month of recording time and, you know, a good two weeks of battery, you can get a lot of cell phone numbers and you can get a lot of verifications with names because what do they say right after they go through and they give you the telephone number? They say, are you Mike? Uh, yeah. Okay, so cell phone number and a first name, 
put you in people or Spokio, and I've got a real solid lead of how to pivot on who you are, on your past addresses, on any people that you know, social media networks, usernames, all that stuff falls into place. So, and people like to lie to other people, but if you don't have a good lie to tell somebody, you always default to the truth. And it's not always, but you know, whatever. So these these apps right here, uh, Pseudo especially, which is the app that I almost left Android for to go through and get to iPhone. Pseudo is an amazing app that will give you up to nine different um, telephone numbers and uh, name, address, kind of fake identity, sock puppet account things. Um, it is a premium service. They'll give you up to three for free. Uh, they are doing some of those stuff here in the future, but it's only iOS right now. It is moving to Android. Uh, the uh, Flip is the Android version of that. It's a little bit less on the privacy side. They kind of leach some information and stuff, but it is something that's comparable. Uh, Burner is a app that works on both iOS and um, Android there. And they give you a free account, and then you pay two ninety nine if you want to re retain the information. However, it's one of those things that if you're at a party and if you really don't care about the person, but you want them to have a phone number, you can throw that at them or something, you know. But having an additional phone number allows you to go through and protect what you have, and make sure that you know only you, the NSA, and your service provider know your phone number. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, Google Voice is an excellent way to go through and get into this and just just try it out without having anything else wherever. Google Voice will give you the free thing, um, the free number, and allow you to go through and pair it to your phone. They do they do request that you assign a real phone number to it as a backup. Just like with everything Google does, they want a backup of a backup of a backup. Um, but it's fun to play with, and Google Voice is nice, whatever. Um, SIM cards, you're getting into a weird area. You can get to the prepaid service and the SIM cards. Um, Per one SIM card, you can activate usually around three accounts. So if you're serious and you want to do this for your entire company or the security department or something like that, you can kind of factor the price cost for you know one SIM card per three accounts, kind of move it from there. So it's something you can experiment with. Uh, prepaid services, you know, uh, Kevin Mitnick came out with a book, uh, The Art of Invisibility, and he goes way into, <laughs> love him or hate him, you know, Mitnick, uh, he goes way into the process of purchasing prepaid phones, whatever, and to the point where you're giving money to a homeless person to go through and get you a phone so you're not on video and all that stuff. And that stuff works if you want to go through and do that, however. But again, measure your own model and see what works for you because not everyone likes, you know, cloaks and hats and stuff. So, uh, but these are, these are excellent. The, the, the top three are, are go to. And like I said, pseudo is probably the best. And eventually pseudo actually, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Pseudo. Trying to lull it back into a false sense of security. Yeah, that worked. No? Yes? I don't know what that is. Okay. So, huh? I'm don't, myself. Don't interrupt, Adrian. I'm just kidding. Uh, pseudo actually is coming out with, I think, next year, um, a, a, uh, a credit card model as well. So pseudo will allow you to go through and, and to create um, kind of the sock puppet accounts on the fly. And then also, if you want to do online purchasing and you don't want to go through and give your credit card to Amazon or anyone else, whatever, because they're going to get breached and your stuff's going to get hacked, you can go through and actually take your credit card, assign a new, um, a new fake uh, credit card, and then for that transaction only, It'll go through and shoot that there. You can do it uh, repeating, like as a monthly bill, like your Netflix account, things like that. Um, so it's one more way to go through and put something up in front of your real stuff that has the ability to really compromise you. Uh, I don't even understand why people put debit cards and stuff online. Debit the emails and all that, you have the ability to go through and get into other social media now, depending upon what you want. There are several outreach PR, HR programs that want to go through and be visible. Business is a very difficult thing to do private. You actively want people to come and purchase your product. So what do you do to go through and help with that? You can, uh, like I said, go and actually check what you're trying to do online. 
You want to want you want to understand who's going to be in control of that. And one thing that I would advise is not to let just one person be in control of an account. There is something called language profiling. If somebody is the only person that is on the account and actively tweeting out or Facebooking or doing the messages, that creates a pattern. And someone can mimic that pattern and use that as a social engineering attack. So if your CEO is the only person on the Twitter account and then your CEO gets patterned and then you get an email from that CEO person requesting money be withdrawn from the, the, the checking account or the pension or whatever it is, then you know it's it's much more likely because they have the same mannerisms as what they're producing online. So it's good to go through and get two or three different people to go through and change up the dialect and the dialogue and the the pro the, the profile the language profile there. Um, connecting with others, it's a social media world where everybody wants to be friends with everybody else. You're gonna have family. Your mom's gonna be on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or whatever it is. Um, they're going to want to connect with you, and it's going to be difficult for you to explain to them why you're trying to do this. So you will have fights with them because they can't go through and point to you and say, oh, that's my son or that's my daughter. But just explain to them why you're trying to do this stuff, and hopefully they will come along with you. Um, one thing with social media and with communication, end-to-end uh, -end communication, or end-to-end -end encryption, I should say, signal, wire, things like that, where you have the ability to communicate and it's not a one-sided, protected conversation. Uh, that's another thing that really does help a lot of families kind of get into uh, the information security or the privacy type of atmosphere. Uh, Proton Mail. Has anybody ever heard of Proton Mail? So that is an end-to-end end -end point encryption email service. It's free to go through and set up. It's it's not difficult. Um, it is a little bit more hazarding. Uh, they do a wonderful. Uh, it's like five dollars a month, whatever, for up to five emails. Plus, they have their own VPN as well, so it's kind of a family thing, um, and that's worth it, uh, in my opinion. So, the last thing is verification. Uh, verification comes with every social media account that you have. Um, you will get emails that you use that are single-use emails that will bounce back, and they say, "Hey, we don't like this email. We're not going to verify your social media account." Or if you get a prepaid cell phone or something like that, and it's from a weird number. The, the service is going to come back and say, hey, we don't like that number. We're not going to verify your account. So you just have to kind of keep trying. Um, like I said, you can use sudo, which is usually always good. Flip is always good. Google Voice actually works amazing. Problem is you only have one Google Voice number. So if you're doing multiple different IDs or sock puppet accounts, it's a little bit more difficult. But come talk to me, and we can find a way around that stuff. So Automation, because we're all lazy and we love automation. Um, Really, the best two things you can go through and do is IFTTT, if then that. Anybody ever heard of that site? It's an automation thing where, uh, and they do amazing things. They're all kind of recipes. So if you have a, if you've taken a photo and you want to go through and post it to uh, Twitter or Instagram or something like that, it'll automatically set it up as long as you have this done. So if you're not using a certain account, then this will be a godsend for you because you can keep that account active. The social media group will not go through and see it as an active and turn it off. It won't see you as uh, spreading bad stuff. So you can pull articles from NASA to go through and pop whenever they publish a new thing. Very, very benign stuff, but it keeps you in the loop and it keeps fresh data coming in, which is what these social media sites want. They want to harvest your data. They want to see what you're interested in. So the more that you have the ability to feed to them, the more they're likely to keep you around, no questions asked. Um, same thing with uh, the TweetDeck. TweetDeck on the on desktops and laptops uh, is free. On mobile, it costs more. But if you have it and you set it up on you know on your account for whatever this Twitter handle is, and you preload a lot of the tweets that you're going to go through and set up for the next month, week, day, whatever it is, you have an automated source where you can just let that sit back and it will publish the content as it needs. So those are two things. In regards to automation that I've used a lot for Sock Puppet accounts, um, it is okay to have real accounts. It's not a problem to, to understand that your threat model is very, very low, and you know, you're single, you don't have kids, you don't have a wife, you, you, you work for a company, but you're not up there. It's okay to use your own real stuff, whatever, and identify with people. Just make sure that your privacy settings are absolutely set up so that you know, there's not somebody who's going to come in and you know, sex bots or whatever are going to be following you or anything else, whatever. Because there are malicious people that will, for no other reason, just try to attack you than they can because you are low-hanging fruit. 
especially botnets, for whatever reason. So with the privacy settings that you've already set up with your Sock Puppet accounts, we need to remove your personal data from the internet. Uh, privacy settings are always a good thing. Opt-out information is really a big deal with um, a lot of these sites like People, Spokio, Family Tree Now. Um, they're all free sites, whatever, and they're all data aggregates. They're all connecting up to four layers of your family. So that means you, your family, your family's family, and then any additional contacts, friends from college, anyone you've connected with, anything that you can go through and find um, through like the third-party uh, kind of trackers. And one good way that you can find out who these things are is if you use Firefox, they have a, uh, Firefox has an app called Lightbeam, and it will track your browser and show you exactly what third-party analytics are following you around. So if, even if you have um, Adblock on or Privacy Badger from the EFF, which is another awesome, awesome app or extension, uh, there are other things that you can go through and have tagged to you, not just cookies, but actual like browser like tracking to go through and see who you are. A lot of stuff happens through MAC address and all that. So just make sure that you are cognizant of that. Uh, so opting out of all those sites really does help uh, limit your attack surface. One other thing, now that, um, was it GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Act, whatever? So uh, if you tour into, let's say, another country that's in the EU, and then you talk to the people who have your data that you want removed and send the email from the EU with the header coming from the EU, they have to remove your stuff. So just a, uh, you know, that actually came from Joe Gray. So if you're watching this, Joe, I use that. But um, one way to go through and kind of speed up this process, because they don't want to get rid of your stuff, and they're not going to unless you press them on it. There, there, are, there are points where you really need this stuff to be removed, like, you know, if you're in law enforcement or, or if you, like I said, are from an abusive relationship or something, you want to make sure that you can get this so that you're not discoverable. So that really does help um, kind of speed up the, the process. No geotagging. Before you delete any social media, make sure that you seed it with disinformation. Um, anything bad or anything that you have, Facebook and all that stuff, change your address, change your hometown, change anything that you have there, whatever. Keep the account open and let it aggregate through the cycle for two months, six months, whatever it is, and then close it. Because even though you close it on your side, we all know they own that account. They're not going to close it. You're going to be a shadow account to other people that want to connect to you. So just be kind of aware of that. Um, giving slightly off information. If your telephone number, your address, your, your social security number, your birthday, you know, whatever it is, add a different zero, add a different date. Give it so it's not something that's actually true and representative but it's close enough to where you know, someone can make a mistake. If you do that on enough different sites, it will start to confuse what you actually are and who you actually are. Uh, and I've seen this over six months, and it does work. It does take a little while for them to go through and scoop the stuff up because they roll on about an every three-month cycle. Um, credit freezes. If you don't already have a credit freeze because Equifax stole or I mean gave away your uh, your social security number, um, credit freezes are an amazing thing. Please, if you have kids, make sure you get your kids a credit freeze. Even if they're below 18, someone is trying to use their stuff right now to go through and set up Comcast. I guarantee you. So credit freezes for your kids uh, are a good thing. And like I said, just keeping old information off of your social media, um, clean up any old tweets, any old posts, anything that's over a year old, there's really no point in it being there, and it's all discoverable. So just be aware of that. Uh, with business, like I said, you need to control your domain. Make sure that all your employees are up to date on the social media policies, um, you know, the social media hygiene. You don't want people who are posting pictures for your your, your rally or, you know, your, your benefit or whatever to be displaying their badge. You don't want them to go through and show the, uh, the back door that has the, the HID security system. You don't want them to go through and show workstations because then someone can fingerprint their laptop, know the OS, know the, uh, the antivirus, anything they can go through and do to pivot off of an exploitation. Exploitation? Anyway. <laughs> Um, testing your, your, your digital and your physical security is always a good thing, and a lot of people are starting to do that more and more. Um, there's nothing that says I can't walk in tomorrow to a place and have an interview. 
and then ask to use the bathroom and then skirt right past them and pluck a rubber duck into somebody else's computer and own infrastructure inside there. So testing all that stuff, making sure that people are aware of what is and what isn't okay, tailgating, social engineering, all that stuff needs to be talked about because it's not us who are going to defend it all the time. It's, you know, it has to be a, a shared responsibility between everybody. With the uh, disinformation campaigns, um, this, again, is depending upon how far you want to go down the rabbit hole. Uh, make sure that it's right for you. You can set up P.O. boxes. One trick with that is if you want a physical address, but it's actually a P.O. box, you can use the P.O. box as the street address. P.O. box is the suite, and then you can have stuff delivered there. That works, and it doesn't work. Some, most of the time it does work, but there have been problems where they, they won't deliver because it's discovered that it's a P.O. box. Uh, LLCs are an amazing way to go through and hide your anonymity. Um, you can go through and register LLC for next to nothing, and it, it protects everything. It, because it's a business, it doesn't ask for personal information, but you can assign whoever you want to be the registrar. Um, market surveys, uh, internet surveys, anything else like that. I've seen internet surveys where you can fill out information and put your address down as you know 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and within a month, Somebody has picked that up and said, oh, Michael James, he lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So it's, it's something you can go through and do, and you have to actively be using it. And the reason is because you're, you're sowing disinformation among everything there. There's no one site that's going to go through and say, we've got exactly what's going on with him. Because if you have all these different sites saying contradicting information, it just it works out better. Address uh, disinformation, GS, uh, GPS spoofing. Like I said, there's, there are apps that allow you to go through and change your GPS location. Uh, phone number disinformation with like the pseudo flip, all those other things. Um, filling out old profiles with bad intel, like I said, the social media stuff. Um, do not try to get a fake ID. Do not try to get a fake passport. Don't, don't lie and cut a piece of you know, old photo off and do that. We, we're not in the business to go through and lie to police or governments or anything else like that. We're trying to protect ourselves from nation states, bad actors, and marketers. <laughs> That's really where it comes down to. If you have a bigger problem than that, then you probably know all this stuff, and I don't need to go through and tell you. But, you know, we're not trying to rep represent criminals or, or, or make this into a criminal organization type activity. So what to do now? Like I said, practice, practice, practice. You want to go through and flex the muscle. Even if you just want to dip your toe in, get a Google Voice number, start giving people that Google Voice number. When people ask for it, you sign up for rewards cards, other things like that, just start to go through and flex that muscle and use that because that will, that will start you into the privacy um, arena. That will start getting you there. Uh, information is really the key. It's really what's going to go through and help you along the way. If you know there's a data leak or if you are – given an email or something else comes out spammy and you know that one email went to that one thing, cut it off. You know it's good, or you know it's bad, I should say. But you know the information that, you, that you're getting is, is bad. Uh, monitor your footprint and move accordingly. What else can you do to help is really what you kinda should be asking yourself in regards to that stuff. Uh, these are additional resources that um, I usually try to give to a lot of people. Justin Carroll and Mike uh, Basil do the... Um, the Intel Techniques, and they have a, a complete security and privacy podcast, which is amazing. Does anybody listen to that? The security and privacy podcast. It's worth checking out. It's on all the. It's a. It's a podcast you can go listen to, and they they deep dive into getting rid of Google, switching to Linux, um, you know, getting off the grid completely, all that stuff there. So check them out. Also, Justin Carroll has a 30 day uh, security challenge about privacy. Um, so it, it's fun to go through and check his stuff out because he will actually show you how to go through and set up VPN stuff, um, kind of be in the know in regards to a lot of the privacy stuff. Michael Basil is an amazing resource. Uh, Hiding from the Internet is his book, and this is the fourth edition. Fourth? I have fingers. Uh, fourth edition now, and uh, it's, it's a treasure trove. Uh, Frank Ahern, um, How to Disappear Completely, um, is a world-class skip tracer. He is the guy who's sent out to go through and get you when you jump bail or you have collection debt or something else like that. He's amazing. It's, he has a really good book that just came out. Uh, Mitnick, Kevin Mitnick, The Art of Visibility. As the, the book is okay. Um, I found some real good, uh, morsels in there, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, OSINTFRAMEWORK.COM. Like I said, that's Justin Nordine's uh, OSINT mind map. It's very good. It's very interactive. It's very simple, and it'll redirect you to all the sites, so it's good to kind of check out. Privacy.com right now is the only place where you can go through and get the, you put your credit card information through them. 
They go through and produce you a fake credit card so that you can pay your bills. That way you have that additional layer of security. And if somebody tries to use it again, it's a one-time single-use virtual card. You can go through and get the number. And let's say you have a $500 credit limit on that one specific card. If you walk into a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's or something else like that, you can just give them the number and they have to run it that way. Just because it's a virtual card doesn't mean you have to swipe it. So it's something to look at. And then Carrot 2 is a search engine. Um, it's a virtual, it, it's, a, it's a visual search engine that allows you to go through and put data in there and see how it forms up. There's, uh, it's, it's very representational for people that do not really get security. So it's something you can kind of get other people working around. I'm pretty sure that I've gone way over, <laughs> so I don't know what time it is. Um, but that's all I've got. Do we have any time for questions or anything? Oh, is it? Yeah. So we got time. Fuck them. Anybody have any questions or anything else? Anybody have any experiences or anything else you want to talk about? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time.